Presidency. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The leadership of um, TISA and all the other civil society groups uh, present here this morning. Uh, the Kenya Kwanzaa Fraternity members who are here. And all our friends, good morning. Hamjambo. Let me say, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the men and women who put this uh, um, meeting together, both from our political formation and the civil society groups. It is a very important uh, moment for all of us, especially in the space where we are focusing on uh, the elections in August. Uh, the conversation that we are having here is a very important conversation that brings together people from uh, different sides of government. We have the politicians, we have others, and then we have um, our good people from civil society. Uh, when I came and saw Daisy, I was laughing and uh, she was wondering, why are you laughing? <laughs> and uh, I like Daisy because uh, she speaks her mind. Sometimes you may not like what she has to say, but she says it anyway. <laughs> Uh, sometimes she has been very unkind to me. I feel like calling. I feel like calling her and telling her, Daisy, surely you cannot say this. But uh, I appreciate that uh, she's a very strong person. And in Kenya Kwanzaa, uh, the women and civil society agenda is alive. And we have many people in our political formation that trace their roots to civil society and women um, uh, 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 the strongest women leaders. I also uh, want to agree with you on three items. Allow me just to break it down to three items. I want to agree with you that the economy is the center, front and back of this election. And any discussion that is not centralized about the economy is not a honest conversation. I think everything else is secondary. And that is why, as Kenya Kwanzaa, you have had us loud and clear that this election is about the economy. And the economy, I agree with uh, my good friend Abraham, that uh, the economy is not in a good place. We cannot deceive ourselves. The economy is not in a good place. And we need to, to sort it out. Against the background of the debt, the rising debt that we have, against the background of the deficit that continues to expand and the payments that we have to make that are not discretionary and that have nothing to do with us making progress but just paying debt and making sure that we are we are moving so as kenya kwanzaa realizing the importance of the economy and uh, i associate myself with your sentiment that about Okoa Uchumi. Yeah, it, it, is, it, it is right. I have heard uh, our worthy competitors say, oh, you know, debt is good so long as uh, it is other people's money anyway. Just use it, you know. If you're going to be spending 1.3 trillion shillings paying debt, and you don't think that is serious, then there is something very wrong somewhere. 
why have we centralized the economy in our conversation? And how do we intend to deal with the things Abraham raised here? Number one, we do not think it is prudent to continue borrowing. It is said when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging first so that you can figure out how to get out of it. We must slow down and eventually stop on borrowing unless it is something that we have calculated about. I dare say that the borrowing spree that we see is actually deliberate. Uh, I don't know for what purpose, maybe to achieve a political end or something, but I don't think it is prudent. And therefore, the Kenya Kwanzaa administration, by God's grace, we, we will first and foremost figure out how to stop borrowing. Slow down, eventually stop borrowing. That's number one. Number two, how do we fund what we need to fund and, and the commitments we have made and the promises we are making? We have two options. When you um, hear us talk about bottom up, bottom up is not bottom versus up. It is bottom up. We believe that there is a huge category of Kenyans that today have no chance of paying taxes, not because they don't want, but because they are not in a position to pay. How, how did we arrive at this pool of Kenyans? We um, uh, inject into the labor market about 800,000, 900,000 people every year. 50,000 get jobs in corporate Kenya. Another 150,000 get jobs in uh, formal uh, uh, SMEs. But 600,000 old Kenyans join this space, which is basically a lottery, you know, that has no, you know, you don't know exactly what you're doing, but you're doing something. Today you're selling this, tomorrow you're selling the other thing. You're making 100 shillings today, you make 200 shillings tomorrow, you get another 300 shillings the next day. It's a lottery, you know. So we have this pool of 550,000, 600, 600,000 Kenyans who join this lottery every year. And that's the pool that keeps increasing. It's now around 10 million people. Hustlers, you know, the people who are uh, doing all manner of jobs, making 100 shillings, 200 shillings. And the biggest challenge that this big body of Kenyans have is, in our assessment, number one, a place to do whatever it is that they are doing. Number two, legislation to protect what they are doing. And number three, which is the biggest animal, is access to credit. The proliferation of Fuliza, for example. Fuliza today lends maybe a billion shillings a day. A billion shillings a day. Why? Because it's the only available credit. And do you know how much people pay for Fuliza credit? 6% per day. That is 2,000% per year. Tell me how you're going to do anything meaningful on money you pay 2,000% per year. You can do nothing. And that's why 
we have 15 million people on CRB, right? So access to credit is a very big, is a, is a very big issue. Our assessment is that this big body of Kenyans who are doing all manner of jobs, and that's why we pushed this Mamamboga to the center of our economic debate, is because she represents that category of Kenyans that have no place to do their business. Most of the time they are doing it in the sun. They have no protection. The kanjo is always there, you know, and they have no access to credit. So um, our uh, experts have worked out if we just made them access credit, even at the current rates of 14% per year, we can move those people from earning 200 shillings per day to earning between 500 and 700 shillings a day. What will happen if that happens? If you do just 200 shillings per day on top of what they are earning today, you will increase their income by about 2 billion shillings a day. You will have 750 billion shillings a year. So what that happens is that we will increase, we will have a bigger pool of people who can buy goods, who can buy services and contribute to taxes, right? So we are widening the tax base. Many people sometimes misunderstand bottom up to mean it is something against the people up the economic ladder. In fact, bottom up provides a firmer foundation for those in manufacturing. Because you need more people with money in their pockets to be able to buy whatever we are manufacturing, whatever we are, uh, our industries are producing. That's how we are going to increase our tax base, and that's how we are going to have more people paying taxes, and that is how we are going to collect more tax. So our approach is to broaden the tax base by empowering the people at the bottom of the pyramid, and they don't need much. The people at the bottom of the pyramid do not need a lot of money. But when they have it, they will turn it around because of the large numbers we're dealing with. And that is why we have come up with the Hustler Fund. And we have said, we are going to learn from what did not work with all the other funds we tried to put together. It must be simple to access this fund. We, 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 are, we are working on the mechanics of how it's going to be different from women fund, from youth fund, and make it much more accessible so that we can be able to drive the economy of the micro and small enterprises about 10 million uh, Kenyans. That's number one. Number two, and, and I'm speaking to what Abraham was asking here, how, so we intend to grow our taxes, and we intend to grow our taxes by putting money where, where, where we get a return. Number two, we are going to uh, invest in agricultural productivity. Why agricultural productivity? Because it's what we have. You work with what you have. Our competitors are telling us they will be giving 6,000 shillings uh, for 2 million families, which works out to 140 billion shillings every year. 
as Kenya Kwanza, we will work with 30 billion, a quarter of what they propose to use. And we will target 2 million households that today are in food deficit with inputs. And we have done the calculations. You just need about between 15 and 18,000 shillings to be able to provide enough inputs for one acre. They are currently producing like three, four bags. You can take it to between 12 and 15 bags if you give them the farm inputs. They will not only, and these are food deficit households at the moment, they will not only produce enough for them to eat, they will give you a surplus. Right? And our 30 billion will be a revolving fund. Their 140 billion is a sinking fund. It's, it's all different. Right? And it's because people don't think through what they say. You know, they don't interrogate what they say. So we, because the challenge we have is a challenge of food security. We have a problem today. We have a serious problem of high cost of living. And that high cost of living, the biggest contribution to the high cost of living in Kenya today is the cost of food. 52, on average, 52, every Kenyan spends 52% of their income on food. That is Kenya National Bureau of Statistics report. If we bring that down to 35, 40, even by just uh, 10 percentage points below, we will do a lot of saving for us to spend in other areas. So we must deal decisively with the challenge of the high cost of living by investing in agriculture. And that is where the space we have, we, we've, 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 we've targeted, we're going to target two million households with fertilizer, seed, and everything else they need to be able to produce. We will not only tackle the challenge of food uh, um, security on one end, but we will also, on the other end, uh, not just create a surplus, but we will uh, bring the farmers into a space, into a, a, a place where uh, we all know that an Abraham you can go and interrogate. We collect about 52% of collectible VAT, right? 52% of collectible VAT. And we do that because Abraham said, not everybody pays their fare of taxes. There are so many people, either because they have the wherewithal, uh, some of us, because we are in positions of power, we can exempt ourselves from paying taxes. We can exempt our friends. We can exempt our businesses. And so not everybody pays. If everybody paid, and we will make sure everybody pays, and we don't have to, it's not rocket science, the reason why we have not automated our whole uh, system, especially on VAT collection, and if you speak to KRA today, there is absolutely no reason why we are collecting 3.6% of our GDP as VAT. 
Rwanda is collecting 8% of their GDP. South Africa is collecting between 11 and 11.5 percent of their GDP. If we moved our tax collection to where Rwanda is, and Rwanda was where we were five years ago, this is not a, a process that will take years. This is a, a, pro, a, a program we can achieve in one year. We can drive our revenues from the 1.8 trillion that we, we are targeting to collect, we can drive it to 3 trillion. We, it is possible for us to collect another 500 billion at the moment if we just collected all the VAT that we need to collect. And if you collect all the VAT that you need to collect, it will come along with another maybe 250, 300 billion shillings on corporate tax. So we must focus on how do we grow a bigger cake. I think that's essentially what I'm trying to say. Expand, broaden the base of the people paying taxes and make sure that everybody who is supposed to pay, pays. That way, we will begin the journey to minimize borrowing. We, 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 because we will have additional resources close to 800 billion shillings that we don't have at the moment. I would have, uh, uh, I'd be happy to have a conversation with Okoa Uchumi and your thoughts. And I would want you to interrogate what I have said. And, and, te and, <laughs> and, te and tell me whether it makes sense and, and whether it, it, it adds up, you know, because uh, I want you to hold me to account on what I have said. So that way we will begin the journey to, um, to, 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 to balance our books because our numbers must add up. We cannot continue growing the deficit. It is dangerous. Yeah? Number three, number four, we are looking at the big challenge today of unemployment. It's a big elephant. When I go to a rally and you find on a Wednesday or on Tuesday thousands of young people in a rally, it also tells you you have a problem. Because these are people who ordinarily would not want to be in a rally if they had something to do. Right? But because they have nothing to do, they have come to the rally. You know, very few have stopped to do what they wanted to do. Majority have come to the rally because they have no, nothing else to do. So, the size of the rally speaks to two things. You know, you can have a very successful rally because there are, two, there are many people. But it also tells you another thing, that you have a very big crisis of unemployment. And we will continue investment, but we will continue investment in areas that not only gives us a quicker return, but also creates jobs. You can grow the economy and not create jobs, like we have done in the big infrastructure programs that we have engaged in, right? So I want to promise you that Kenya Kwanzaa will begin to focus on investments in areas that will not only create for us jobs, but it will give us a quicker return on our investment. Because it's business. Let me give this example that I have given and people have 
uh, not taken it very kindly. We invested in a gun manufacturing factory here in Ruiru, four billion shillings, and we created 100 jobs. Yeah, it's a good thing. We need guns for our security. But in a country where you have thousands of young people without jobs, priority should be investing in infrastructure that creates jobs, because that's what your problem is. The same four billion shillings, if we had invested in um, uh, informal manufacturing, we would have created 5,000 jobs. Same 4 billion shillings. So the policy choice that you have to make is do you invest 4 billion shillings to manufacture guns and create 100 jobs, or do you invest it in uh, informal manufacturing and create 5,000 jobs? That's a simple choice we have to make. And I want to tell you, that's what makes the difference between whether we're going to turn around this country or not. We are very clear on what kind of investments, and that is why you have heard us clearly say that value addition, agro-processing, manufacturing is going to be a very big part of the investments we are going to make and we will begin uh, to, to, to slow down on hard infrastructure. Not, not stop, but you know, balance between the infrastructure we are investing in currently and what will give us jobs and what will give us money in people's pockets. Um, Let me leave that there because uh, of time. I, have, uh, I wish I had more time to explain uh, what, what, what we, our plan. Let me just speak about the women issue and AGBO. I think we, we have a women charter which we have signed in. And in that women charter, we intend to make it much more easy. We have said in the Hustler Fund, women-led organizations that have LPOs from AGBO will be automatic beneficiaries of the Hustler Fund resources. Because we see that many women have, uh, get, get these LPOs, but they never get to finance whatever it is that they have. And you've shown us that part of the problem is pending bills. We need to think about that. Part of the challenge you have said is sexualization, politicization of, of that whole space. We will need to sit down with you and look at what interventions will we make so that we clean up that space and make women access uh, those opportunities. And finally, uh, transformational leadership, which um, which, which you have, you have, you have, uh, uh, you've talked about. And I think, um, I think transformational leadership also speaks to track record. You know, there is nobody who has arrived from anywhere. All these candidates are people we know. Right? Nobody has arrived from anywhere. We know everybody and we know their track record and their, and their performance record. And so, uh, uh, if we talk about transformational leadership, um, we, we, can, we can clearly uh, assess everybody's record, track record, on their, uh, what they have managed to achieve in whatever positions they have been. I have been minister for, I've been a member of parliament for Eldoret North, I can account for my time. I have been minister for agriculture, I can account for my space in agriculture. In higher education, I can account. As deputy president, I can account. 
Everybody else should be held to account. And then number two, you spoke about a very pertinent issue, and that is corruption and theft of public or misuse of public funds. It is a big animal, and sometimes it is pushed around without clarity of what will happen. Our approach as Kenya Kwanzaa is that we must not personalize. We must not uh, um, politicize corruption. We must deal with it from an institutional space so that everybody, including the president, is held to account. Our position is that the fight against corruption hasn't gone very far because it is directed by somebody from somewhere and he or she determines who is corrupt and who should be followed. If you are not my friend, then you are corrupt. But if you are my family, you are not corrupt. Why haven't we gotten the camps up billionaires? Why? Because they are friends and they are family of the people who tell us they are in charge of corruption, of fighting corruption. Right? What we are saying is the following. Why, for example, while the Constitution says the Judiciary Fund should have 2.5% of our budget, why is the Judiciary continuing to get 0.7, 0.8% of our budget? Why hasn't the Judiciary Fund been operationalized? It is because there are people who want to continue pulling strings around the judiciary. And that is why the judiciary lacks the capacity to deal with matters of accountability and corruption the way it should. Kenya Kwanzaa will deploy all the resources required by the Constitution and the law. If it is 2.5%, it will be 2.5% and the judiciary fund will be operationalized so that we give the judiciary the capacity, human, technical, and every other capacity to deal with matters of accountability and matters of justice without reference to anybody. That's number one. We must stop the fight with the judiciary. I have said that it doesn't matter whoever is nominated by the Judicial Service Commission. They don't have to be my friends. I don't have to like them. If they have passed the interview and they are people who uh, have, have gone through the process, they must be given the chance to serve in those offices. Like, for example, the six judges that have not been appointed. Why? I will appoint those judges day one and give everybody a chance to serve in their capacity. Are we, are we together? Number two, why does the DCI, the ACC, and, and the, the IG, who is responsible for investigating matters corruption, why do they continue to rely on a budget from the office of the president? Why? The constitution is very clear. The law is very clear. They need to have an independent budget. They need to have an independent accounting officer so that it doesn't matter who they want to investigate. Even if the president does not like the investigation, the investigation must go on because they have operational, constitutional, and financial independence. We must take the fight against corruption 
are not higher. How does uh, the fight against corruption, for example, take in the president in South Korea? It's because the fight against corruption is run by institutions. If it was run by the president herself, would she have become a, uh, would she, would, she, would the corruption net have found her? Right? So that is where we want to take it. So that it doesn't matter whether it is family, whether it is my friend, whether it is my political ally, or whether it is the president himself. The institutions must be strong enough to deal with everybody. I don't know whether we get that right. That is our, that is going to be our, and we want to be held to account to that. Finally, of course you know corruption thrives around patronage. And patronage is a benefactor of conflict of interest. And the whole of that space takes us to state capture. And that's where we are as a country. We have to deal with state capture. We have to deal with conflict of interest if we have to deal with corruption in Kenya. It just goes that far. Finally, um, huh? I have made a commitment, <laughs> a public commitment, and in writing, that we will achieve the two-third gender rule. I have made that commitment. Why do I say so uh, with certainty? I say so with certainty because I have great women around me who will work with us to make sure that the mechanism is found for, acquire, for making sure that happens. And I undertook that that mechanism is going to be ready in three months. Boss Cholet is here. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, I have no doubt in my mind that working with the women champions, me being one of them, we will be able to achieve the two-third gender rule. I have already made it public that we don't want this to be tokenism. No. It's not about a woman or ten women in cabinet. It's, it's the whole space of women being at the center of what we are doing because they form 50% of our population. Um, so, so that commitment you have uh, from me, and it's unequivocal. In fact, those of you who are keen observers, at BOMAS, I was the only woman champion. Even the women were shouting at me when I was prosecuting their case. <laughs> That's how unfortunate it gets sometimes. <laughs> the people you are fighting for are actually shouting. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, there was an attempt to relegate women yes. to some space there where there are flower people, yeah. you know? And women were busy clapping, and I was telling them, guys, don't you see you are being, you know, you're being shortchanged? Mm -hmm. eh? It's only later that some of them were calling me, but you made, you, your point was right. We didn't, we didn't understand it properly, but uh, you, you, yeah. you know? So when I say I'm a women champion, it is the truth, you know. So um, 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 so that's where we are. And finally, I don't know whether I have forgotten anything else. Um, the rest of the of the of the discussion we will we will canvas as we as we move into 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 the future. 
Um, uh, the extractives I have had, uh, uh, the good lady who talked about it uh, very well, and I think that is space that women can claim, and we can work together towards uh, achieving the intentions of um, of the country, as we as we do uh, the desires and the aspirations of of women in our country. So, uh, to all of you. And finally, to civil society. Hmm. I, know, I know that uh, we have very strong people who have joined to be policy makers, to be um, um, senior people in government from the civil society. I want to promise you that uh, for us to be accountable, because the civil society must keep the space to hold us to account. The same way, the reason why I have a problem, and I have always had a problem with a handshake, is because it created a mongrel of a government. Nobody knew where government stopped and where the opposition started. And once you have that kind of a scenario, you compromise accountability. And once you compromise at accountability, you will never have an accountable government. So I don't want the civil society to be our friends. I want them to be our partners. Yeah? Because this friendship brings a relationship that then undermines your clarity on how to hold us to account. I really, the best the civil society can do to us is to hold us to account and to point to us when we are going wrong, they, sh they must be able to speak authoritatively that this is not right. And you will bring a lot of value to governance in our country if you hold government to account. The same way I would encourage that parliament or the legislature should be as independent as it can get so that they can hold government to account or the executive for that matter to account. Uh, any government is as good as the accountability mechanisms that are in place. And the two very prominent ones is the legislature and our civil society. I really am looking forward to how we can uh, work with the civil society uh, in a manner that they can be promoted to do what they do best uh, by holding everybody to account. So uh, I'm looking forward to working with you guys as partners. And, uh, and, and, and uh, I, I want to encourage you, uh, we may be friends, but please do your job, you know? You, you will assist us greatly if you held us to account. It would, it, would, it, would, it would be good for you, it would be good for us, and it would be good for governance, the governance of our country. So thank you very much and God bless you. Let's give His Excellency another round. Thank you, Excellency, for, for your time. I'm not the one giving a vote of thanks, but I just want to. The engagement is open, and that linkage should be there and, and, and continued. Your Excellency, it is uh, one of those uh, moments that uh, we know that you have taken time from your busy schedule to come here. The civil society, I don't know who will be giving a vote of thanks, but uh, they would want a photograph with your Excellency to just for